Hey. 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 Tokyo Shik It's another episode of Say It Loud, y'all. You know what to do. Get your wine and your wine glasses. Get your henny and your shot glasses. Get your mixed drinks if that's what you're doing tonight. For those of y'all that ain't fucking with me, I get you. We on quarantine, we're on a. Go ahead and brew some tea. Get your lavender, your chamomile, or whatever you need. Sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Stay Loud, y'all. Let's go. How did I bring my dreams alive? Why, with a Anchor podcast, of course. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor does the hard work and distributes your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money with your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app today or go to Anchor FM to get started. All right, so we're also streaming live on YouTube right now, by the way. (laughs) So we are here. Welcome to another episode of Say It Loud. It is Karen L. And today we are here with Mr. Weldon. How do you pronounce your last name, Weldon? Mick Williams. Mick Williams. So I don't know if my listeners know who you are, Mr. Mick Williams, Mm -hmm. but recently I saw an article about you. I actually screenshot it and put it into my phone because I was like, I need to talk to Weldon about this. (laughs) So maybe you can introduce yourself and tell our audience a little bit about you. Sure, sure. As already stated, my name is uh, Weldon McWilliams. I am a an assistant professor of his, uh, I'm sorry, an associate professor of history at Dutchess Community College, located in upstate New York, Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, in, in Dutchess County. Uh, I'm also uh, the pastor of the Christ Temple Baptist Church in Patterson, New Jersey, uh, and uh, I have a passion for teaching. I have a pa- a passion for. Uh, um, activism and, and community organizing and, and things of that sort, and uh, that's 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 really what motivates me and, and, and moves me, and all those things kind of incorporate uh, who I am. Uh, I'm, I'm active. Uh, I'm very concerned about social issues. Um, I love to teach. I'm, history is a. Uh, I'm in love with history, specifically in Black history, and. Uh, I, I am a man of faith, uh, haven't always uh, acted or behaved that way, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, faith does play a big part in, in my life and, and it has done a, a good job at settling me down and, and seeing things from uh, a different perspective as I get a little older in my age. So I think it's very interesting that you're a pastor, by the way. So like in my yeah. experience growing up, every pastor that I've known, and don't take this the wrong way, they've all been mm-hmm. old. Right. You know what I mean? That's the uh-huh. idea in the head. Then ladies, I mean, he, he, he looks very good, by the way. Um, I appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you. Um, how did that come about? Because usually when you, you know, just for me, in my experience, all the pastors I've ever met or all the churches I've ever been to, the pastor's always like an old man. So how did that happen for you? Well, and and, and I, sh- I will say that there is a growing number of young preachers. And now with, I think with technology and just being able to live stream and see churches, not necessarily having to be in the same locale, it does allow some of these young preachers to be more in the limelight. Uh, but you know, for me, it was just a call. There was a call on my life. Uh, I responded to that call that happened for me at the age of 27, wow. where, uh, I was just going through, uh, some things. I was actually in a PhD program at Temple University in African-American studies. Uh, I had consciously stepped away from organized religion from the age of 21 until I returned back at 27 when I received the call. So uh, I was actually out of organized religion. I, I didn't think that it sit, it didn't sit well with how I was living my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was a particular call at a point in my life where things were getting hectic. I was, I had my first child. I um, uh, I was finishing up my PhD, and 
there's just the way I was living my life. There had to be a change and there was a spiritual awakening in me. And uh, that's when I felt the call into ministry. And I studied under a, a pastor in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I studied intensely under him for three years. Uh, and eventually I was ordained as a, uh, a minister in uh, 2011, which wow. was a year after I received my PhD. And uh, I moved back to New York, worked with my dad, who is a pastor in, in, in New York, worked under him for about six years. And then there was a vacancy uh, at the church that I currently pastor. And uh, somebody threw my name in the hat, went through this whole process, uh, like a search, just like a job. There was a yeah. search committee. Uh, they, I was on a list of people they were looking at and uh, had to preach there a couple Sundays and, and they really liked what I brought to the table and uh, they extended the offer to me and I accepted it. So, so how long yeah. have you been there now? Good, good question. I, I meant to say that I've been pastoring at the Christ Temple Baptist Church officially since uh, May. I was installed as the pastor in May of 2018. So May will be two years. Wow. Congratulations. That's big. Thank you. Thank That's you very big. much. I, I love representation. Mm -hmm. And I'm all for, I love everybody's represent, representation, but I'm definitely for um, African-American representation, especially in men, because mm -hmm. um, as an educator myself, I know mm -hmm. that, you know, it's easy for us to say what our kids should be and that what they can aspire to. Um, but it's more important for us to emulate those things so that they can see them in real life. Definitely. And so shout out to you for doing that and making Thank that, you. not just for being the pastor, but also doing that while you're getting your PhD. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a very interesting part of my life. But again, it, I, I am very happy in, uh, as far as the choices that I end up making. And some of it was divinely inspired. Uh, as I mentioned, yeah. just that call, I, I felt like I had no choice but to be obedient uh, at that time. So to my God. question to you, and, and we can talk about this later, but my question to you is that you are the pastor. <laughs> Right. And yes. I know I'm all over the place and we're going to talk about the PhD in school. But like, do your friends teach, do they still invite you to the club because you <laughs> when you're the pastor? Yeah. So uh, that's interesting. Or do they uh, treat you different? No, I don't. Uh, I, my good friends. And, you know, as you get older, you really begin to see how many true friends you have. Right. right? right. So so my true friends, friends who I, I'm, I'm friend, friends with, they still treat me the same. And okay. uh, and I interact with them. I won't say completely the same, but I interact with them uh, well enough to, you know, let them know that there's no harm in still treating me like Weldon, your boy, when we were right. boys. Right. Uh, uh, as I was talking about some of the dramatic changes in my life, I, I, I really stopped really going out around 26, 27 years old. So I, I stopped going out around that age i'll go out every now and again yeah if a friend of mine has a birthday party and yeah, i want to say me too things like that but i don't yeah. i don't go out and i haven't really gone out since about 26 years old and you know I, i'm 40 now so it's been a while since i've yeah. gone out on a regular basis yeah i um i go out if someone invites me out they're having an yeah. event for work for you know promotion things of that nature but I'm yeah. not the girl that's gonna hit you up on Friday night. Talk about what's the <laughs> way. It's, it's yeah. yeah, it's it's not that. It's about to be this pasta and a salad and a Netflix. Uh, <laughs> yes. yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not yeah. that. Um, you know, my heels probably got dust on them because I. <laughs> no, nah, I like to go out once in a while and have a good time. Right. It's somebody's birthday, we're celebrating. I'm I'm all for it. But to mm -hmm. every Friday, Saturday, so like I stopped doing that when I had kids. You know, exactly. I, my friends used to take me out and it'd be six o'clock in the morning and my eyes are burning and they're like, let's go for breakfast. I'm like, look, I got Chuck E. Cheese in about three hours. Like, I can't do this. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? I don't have exactly. nothing to do. I got, you know, I got karate. I got Chuck E. Cheese. I got a birthday mm. party tomorrow. Like, I can't. I can't. And so um, my life, too, is in that place. And, and honestly, I just I don't care to do that. The last time I actually went out with my girlfriends for my birthday, um, the music was so loud, I couldn't talk to them. Right. <laughs> and it was that day that I was like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I'm like, why am I screaming? How are that kids? Yes, you know yes. I mean? Like, I just, I was like, I wanted to build with my people and I just couldn't do it in that environment. So, um, and it's while a new I, groove now, right? Like, like yeah. for my birthday, I want to go away. Self-care yeah. trips. It's, it's not about really going I out. I've traveling quite a bit too, sir. Yeah. 
<laughs> See, yeah. that's and I need to improve. I, I, I'm not a big traveler. Uh, I'm scared to fly, but I, I'm you? trying to get. I am, well, but I'm trying to get over don't that. Don't say that. You got that. Say that again. Your yeah. pictures don't say that. Yeah, I you just started this. really getting into it though. So okay. when I turned 40, I flew, uh, and I'm trying to get over this fear of flight and I fear of flying. I flew somewhere earlier this year, and I'm yeah. just trying to really get over that because yeah. I want to travel and I want to see other places in the world. But like for me now, you know. Celebrating my birthday is about going out somewhere, seeing something I haven't seen before. Yeah, Even same. though I am thinking about, I do want to have like a, a birthday party and the theme, I want it to be like 1997, the year I graduated. And I think I'm that'll thinking be fun. about that. I yeah, think that'll yeah, be fun. I'm, I'm inviting myself. That. Yeah, oh, you coming, definitely. I'm going to rock some door knockers, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you invited, you invited, no doubt. So that's what I'm thinking about if I want to, I think off. you should do that. And then I think you should yeah. leave the party and go straight to the airport. <laughs> yeah. That's go the plan. Somewhere. That's how yes. we're doing it now. You know that what I mean? That sounds like a great party. plan. And yes. then we're going straight now over to the airport. Just and then by then you'll be sleeping. You won't have a problem flying. You know what? I'm going to really put that in the works now. I want a party <laughs> and then fly out in the universe. Out yeah, yes. of course. That sounds dope. That yeah, sounds I'm dope. the same way. I have been um, trying for my 30s. I said that every year I wanted to go somewhere for my birthday. And I did almost maybe three out of the 10 years I didn't. And then now mm -hmm. every year I'm just like, and I don't even want to do regular stuff anymore. I'm like, I've been to the Caribbean. I've seen all the beaches and stuff. They're beautiful. But now I want to like... I don't know. I want to go to India. I want to go to Bali. Mm. I want to go to, I'm dying to go to Cuba and shoot Cuba mm. with my camera. Like, I just want to walk in the street and take pictures. Me too. Um, I got to go there. Yeah. And I just want to eat the food because I'm a foodie and a fatty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying not to be, but ideally anywhere I go, I'm like, what do they make here? That's what I want. You know? Right. Um, so right. yeah, so it, it's nice to do that stuff, but I kind of want to see the world, you know, from a different yep. place. And then I think, and as an educator, um, I just think it's so nice when I could share that with my students and they're like, Miss Mari, right. that's really you in front of the Eiffel Tower. And I'm like, yes, that's really me in front of the that's Eiffel right. Tower. That's right. Like, I didn't think that place was real. I'm like, no, it's real. You know? <laughs> so, um, yeah. I think- And traveling, it, it, it expands our perspectives and as teachers, right? That's what, that's yeah. what we're supposed to give our students. We're supposed yeah. to uh, expose them to other perspectives. And sometimes you can't get that unless you travel and see new places, experience new cultures. So, yeah. yeah. No, no, I love yeah. that. I definitely love that. Yeah. So tell me about now this PhD and teaching history. And like, first of all, how are you doing that right now it, with all the Corona stuff going on? Well, so I'm, I'm thank God I've been out of actually today is my 10 year anniversary of receiving my PhD. Oh, I got wow. my PhD. You're just killing it. You're just killing yeah. it today. I, 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 this is a good, you good have day. A lot so. to celebrate. Yes, indeed. This year, April yeah. 19th, 2010, I defended my dissertation at Temple University uh, and received my PhD. So it's been 10 years to the day. Wow. Uh, and uh, cheers. I don't have a drink, but cheers. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so right now, I, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an associate professor of history at Dutchess Community College, and we are teaching remotely now. So the, the campus has become like an online university. You use Zoom, uh, but I understand there is a digital divide with some of our students. So some of our students can't can't uh, utilize Zoom. You, you, you're communicating through them with email. You're giving out assignments. It's not the same. I'm not gonna right. act like it is the same. There is an intimacy that's missing from the live lived experience teaching with the students there. Um, but it is the, the reality that we're in now. So uh, we kind of keep my meeting times with my students at the same with these classes, the same times it would be if we were meeting on campus. We have our Zoom meetings right. at that time. And really, I'm just giving them assignments, giving them the readings, giving them opportunities to ask questions. Uh, and I'll give them, uh, they'll give me the opportunity to really highlight some points, but that's how it tends to move now. Yeah. It's, yeah. How, um, how about you? Are you doing I'm teaching remotely right now. Right. Um, right. but I, I like it, but I also feel again, I'm, you know, I teach middle school. Our students don't, I teach in title one, which means that, you know, they don't have the services that they need and right. not everything is accessible. Um, my biggest issue I feel as an educator right now is that we haven't really looked at the social emotional effects of this on people. And right. it's kind of like, all right, let's keep working. 
you know, we're just going to push it out online. And we're not really considering that, like, you know, I spoke to a student today and it's like, okay, well, my mom's not working right now. And she got laid off because of this. And I have another right. student whose parent, you know, is um, stuck in another country and can't get out. And I really think that, you know, we're trying, we have this mentality of like, well, let's just keep going, you know, but people are right. um, emotionally and impacted by this. And, you know, how are we going to deal with that? Cause we can't just like pretend that, you know, it's not affecting their lives or how they're managing. Or, you know, someone said to me, one of the teachers were like, well, what do you mean everyone doesn't have an iPhone or doesn't have internet access? And I'm like, okay, do you not know where we teach? Like yeah. not every, you know, not every family has that. I have kids that are asking me to buy them food. Like, are you serious? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. so I think, you know, we have to really look at those things when we're talking about education, because, you know, it's easy for us to be like, okay, just give the assignments, let's keep going you know because right. we have the privilege to do that but some mm -hmm. people's lives are really changing from this and they don't talk to me and send me music um and mm -hmm. just kind of be more of a social support because they're all isolated too right Right. Well, and you know, as adults, we kind of deal with that. But as a kid, it's just like they like today. They're like, "Smile." What about the prom? I'm like, "Oh, I don't know. We, we might not have a prom." You know, what about yeah. your trip? I'm like, "Oh, you know." So, um, you know, they're all yeah. isolated, and this part for them is very social. Like that part of school is very social. So, yes. um, you know, I think just looking at those kind of things are are important. Even at, at this point, even more important. Uh, than the work and then you yeah. know I think the work also has to be it gi giving assignments is great but part of having a teacher there is that there's somebody to explain it to you and answer your questions and give you that one-on-one -on -one. and that's the part of teaching I like yep yep and that's the part I miss the, the the interaction with the student uh in sharing the information the way that I impart information the way that they receive information and when you're in the same place same room same right. space you can actually see how that all takes place. Uh, I do miss that aspect of it. And it does feel a little um, strange, I guess is the word I'll use uh, in the sense that I'm just giving out, I'm just pumping out assignments, yeah. you know, as far as the, the college that I work at, you know, we did not push back our end date, even though they canceled graduation, we did not push back the end of the semester date. Grades still need to be given great right, assignments right. need to be given out. So everything is still being pushed along. But yeah. there is this this level of intimacy uh, uh, with the student that's gone. And yeah, you got to really that. take into account how that's going to impact them and the teacher. Because I know yes. I feel I feel like it's just too robotic. It's just yeah, boom, 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 that's boom, how boom. I feel. I feel like it's just get it out there, get it out there, give mm -hmm. grades. And I'm like, but we're all feeling something. How do we just all be have some sense of normalcy? So. Um, I'm trying to brainstorm an idea to figure out how I can create a social hour or a town hall for my students so that everybody mm. can kind of like come together and I don't know, do a Netflix watch party or do a town hall where we just have a meeting or something. Place kind of as much as possible with this going on just you know kind of hang out and it not feel like they're taking information from me but just being normal kids awesome that's awesome yeah You're really so that, yeah that's awesome yeah so i have it on my agenda to do i i haven't um flushed out all the ideas but you know it's there so, and you're a doer. I, so I like uh -huh. that you're 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 a doer you know it's one thing to just Hey, this is an idea, but I like the way you take an idea and you really try to put it into practice. There's not a lot of people like that. So I know if um, you thought it and if you think it, it'll probably you'll find a way to do it. Yeah, so no, I, I have a couple of ideas. Um, I don't like to sit stagnant. You would know this about me. I don't like to sit stagnant. Yeah. I don't watch TV. I'm always my mind's always going. I might as well put it um, to good use and um and be productive and so that's what my days are like and that's what my teaching is like and that's what me raising my kids are like because that's just who i am i guess you know awesome. so yeah, tell awesome. me about this article that um this write-up and i have to find it but i know i had it um there was like three people in was it rockland county Yes, yes, yes. That, uh, it was like three people to look for that are up and coming in um, Rockland County and in community. So tell me about that article. 
Yeah, I believe it was an article that uh, the news, local newspaper did for Black History Month, and they uh, sought to identify three up and coming, I guess was the, use, the word they used, up and coming or rising Black leaders in Rockland County. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm glad that somebody uh, apparently gave them my name and uh that's that's that was great that i guess to be seen in that way um and i hope that my activity and the actions and the work that i do, I do have um it. i hope that it matches that yeah. <laughs> yeah i do have i told you it said meet three rising leaders in rockland's black community and that it sets yeah. out with three young african-american leaders and i was like wait a minute i know that guy and i um yeah. and so <laughs> needed a haircut in that picture too <laughs> well, you're so humble. You're like somebody put my name in this, so you just don't know where this comes from. Because I, no, I actually I got a call. The reporter actually called my church in oh. Patterson, and I actually thought he was looking for my dad because my dad pastors in Rockland, and I'm like, you got the wrong. I'm named after my dad, so yeah. of course, right with the fourth. So I, I said, you got the wrong guy. You want to talk to the one in Rockland? And he was like, no, 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 I got the right one. So I don't know who wow. gave uh, him my name, uh, but you know, I conducted the the article, and I mean, I did the interview, um, and he asked me some of my own thoughts and perspectives about Rockland and leadership in general, and how uh, leadership might change from generation to generation. Uh, so yeah. I was glad to lend some of those thoughts to the article. And uh, I appreciate whoever it was. Thank you for uh, thinking of me, I guess, and, and letting me be in that group. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was more than one person probably because they had to sit down oh. and look to a couple people, right? And say, okay, well, we yeah. got to narrow this down to three. That's not an easy job to do. Right, right, right. And oh. I, yeah, I'm grateful. And, but I just hope that... Um, the work that I guess would ever put me out there, I hope I continue to do the work. Cause man, there's so much work, you know, there's so much work yeah. we have to do. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, uh, disparities in Rockland don't exist, but being that I live in Rockland and, and you're familiar with Rockland, like, yeah. you know, we have disparities here, like anywhere else. And yeah. uh, there's just some work that, you know, that, the black community, the communities of color, they need some advocates that are out here really doing the work uh, to make sure that their voices are heard and they have a fair shot and a decent shot at, at being successful as well. Yeah. So let me ask you, you are a, you have a PhD and you teach history. You're mm -hmm. a pastor at a church. We're going to yeah. get into your podcast in the second half. How, and, and you're a dad. How do you yeah. manage all of this? Some of it was uh, unplanned, <laughs> but no. Because <laughs> that seems like a lot to me. I mean, I, I manage a lot, but I don't manage that much. Like, how do you find the time to manage all of this effectively? I, I think the blessing in it for me is that I really don't feel everything that I do seems interconnected one with the other. And I think the interconnectedness of all these different uh, things that I do helps me where it doesn't feel like I'm doing as much as it may seem like I'm doing. Right. Uh, you know, involved, there's a lot of teaching involved in my preaching. And it was funny. I remember one of my students <laughs> said to me, why do you teach like you're preaching? Like uh, I had a student ask me, like, <laughs> I was very passionate about a <laughs> particular topic. Right, right. You <laughs> teach like you're preaching. So there's a lot of blending in, right. in what I do and, and the approach and, and part of being a pastor is teaching as well. So my preparation as far as teaching a class or pastoring a, ter a church, a lot of that preparation is it's the same thing. It's the same type and same kind of preparation. So it's not like I have to really do anything too much different. Right. Um, being a father is the, the greatest and the best title that I have. Um, and uh, I always wanted to be an involved and active father. Uh, so I definitely enjoy doing that enjoy sharing time, spending time, having fun. So I just, it, it doesn't, not too much of it seems like work. I enjoy pastoring. I enjoy right. teaching. I enjoy being a father. Yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't ever feel too much like work. Yeah. So that's I guess how that's I feel how. right now. Like I do yeah. a lot, but I'm like, nah, it doesn't feel like hard work if you love what you do. Right. And exactly. I know it sounds so cliche, 
but that's the reality of it. Like if True, you're doing right. something that you're happy with and you're doing something, then you want to do it, you know, right. and it doesn't, you know, you get up and you get it done and it doesn't feel like a burden if it's something you're happy to do. And that's right. just- I, Honestly, I couldn't see, I couldn't see myself doing anything else. If I wasn't teaching, if I wasn't pastoring, I don't know what else I would do, but I probably would not enjoy what I was doing, right? right? Unless I was just rich somewhere, living on an island, or I could get used to that. But, you know, <laughs> it's as far as- I could get used to that though. I mean, I could no. get used to it, but I couldn't still sit for two, three years of my life and do absolutely nothing. Oh no, you would probably start yeah. up stuff. You would have, yeah. you would be an yeah. entrepreneur. I would definitely would be an advocate. Yeah. I would definitely be volunteering. Yeah. I'd be definitely giving back to communities. Mm -hmm. um, I always told my parents, I was like, I'm never going to be rich. And they were like, why not? And I was like, because if I ever got that rich, I would be investing back into communities, building mm. businesses. I would still be giving money away, you yeah. know what I mean? And I'm okay with that. I'm okay yeah. with that. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think that just that's- Just loving what you do. Yeah, and, and I think there's a quality of a person that just some people are going to do it, some people are not. It's either in you or it's not in you, and that's okay. And if you choose to do it, then that's who you are, and that's fine. And that's part of who I am, you know? Yeah, indeed. So that's cool. And we appreciate who you are, Cameron. <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> um, we're going to go to this commercial and come right back, you guys. We're going to talk with Weldon a little bit more about his podcast that has just recently launched. I want to hear all about it, and you guys should listen and follow. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about school and some of your goals um, for the future and, and where you see yourself coming because you're doing a lot. All right. So we'll be back right after this commercial. Now. Sweet Vibrations is the official sponsor of the Say It Loud Ho Bag. Yes, they are. If you didn't know, Sweet Vibrations is an adult boutique that delivers innovative lifestyle products and embraces the taboo of sexual wellness instead of hiding it. Simply put, they inspire each and every one of us to embark on our own sexual wellness journey. Whether it's the girl's best friend, a little pixie, the perfect match, or tulips, there's something for everyone. And you deserve something sweet. So visit their website at www.sweetvibe.toys. Use our Say It Loud discount code, L-O-U-D, loud, for discounts. Follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Sweet Vibrations. I mean, ladies, we all deserve a good vibe. And we are back with um, Weldon. Weldon, you have yes. a podcast coming out. Is yeah, it out? I it's out. I saw the it's, logo. I was like, I yeah. Don't know. It's out. I, I couldn't help myself. I wanted to be like you. And I said, <laughs> You're hey, lying. <laughs> Sister Karen is doing their thing. So I got to get in this game. But um, yes, so uh, uh, I am doing a podcast with uh, three of my best friends. We grew up together. I'm sorry, two, it's three of us together. Two of my best friends, we grew up together. We've known each other since grade school. Um, and uh, we, we, the podcast is entitled Three Kings Talk. Yeah, and it's, I saw the logo, um, it's beautiful by the way. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And, and uh, that's shout out to my boy, Andrew, who's also on the podcast. He, he's the one, he's a graphic designer. You nailed so it. He did that. Yeah, he did that for us, and uh, we thank him for that. And and the podcast is just again three black men who see themselves as as you know smart, productive individuals, kings. We see ourselves yeah, as kings, yeah, and, as and, and 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 we are you know sharing uh, our perspectives and our thoughts and our opinions on on a lot of different things. So. Um, we, we decided to just make it a podcast. We, we, we would typically, we're in a chat group with each other. There's a few yeah. others of us in this chat group. And we just said, let's just make this chat group a podcast, basically. Right. And, and, and the discussions that we would typically have with each other, we decide to uh, put it on pack podcast format and uh, carry it out like that. So we talk about everything from pop culture to politics and relationships to religion and we're going to, you know, talk about uh, as many different things as we can and and really uh, discuss discussing from our perspective. And also uh, we're going to have guests on because we understand that as three kings, 
you, you know, our perspectives still can't be seen as the universal perspective. Right. We need, we're going to need perspectives from our queens. We're going to need perspectives from people outside of our culture to just give us a fuller uh, a picture, a more holistic picture of some of these things. So uh, I, I, I'm I'm so happy, excited, and I'm blessed by this podcast. And shout out to, to Andrew and Rashad, who also co-host the Three Kings Talk podcast with me. Yeah. So I want to know, like, what's the vision as far as like, where do you want to take this podcast to go? Like being three men and being able to share so much knowledge, um, not just with each other, but with the rest of like the world and global and with your voices, like, where do you see this going, you know, and who do you hope to touch? Well, the good thing is we, we, we have put no expectations on it in the sense that you know, we're not trying to make sure someone so hears this. Is, wherever it will take us, it'll take us. As long as we remain uh, respectable as to who we are, we remain committed to the values that we hold ourselves to. Uh, we definitely uh, want to touch uh, those who will listen and those who will listen, we hope can, you know, that we'll be able to impart some things. But also we want it to be known that, you know, we have three black men here who are uh, family men who are fathers who are uh, in healthy relationships uh you know we we are uh, contradictory to some of the mainstream stereotypes that they continue to project about black men that there are some black men out here a lot of black men who have worthwhile things to say who are doing worthwhile things in their community and in their families and uh, that's that. That's what we want to give off. That's the energy we want to give off. That we have something to say. We have something worth saying and something worth listening to. I love that. I love it, and I appreciate it because I feel that not for nothing. And let's keep it hunted. This is this is the part of the show where you get in the hot seat now, Weldon. Uh oh. Um, uh -oh. I actually feel like. And so when I was starting my podcast, I felt some of the same thing. I said that the representation of African-American and women of color was not the woman that I aspired to be. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I watch things on TV and I ain't hating on nobody. I'm just saying like, yeah. that's not the life I live. That's not who I am as a woman. That's not who I am as a daughter, a mother, a sister, now a grandma. Um, mm -hmm. And there needs to be some representation. Like, what about the people like me? Like, like you know what I mean? We're celebrating in some cases, all the wrong things, you know, in mm -hmm. some cases, I, I don't think that what you're doing is wrong. I, it's just wrong for me. I'm not judging. Mm -hmm. And I wanted <laughs> to create something because I don't, I don't knock what any, anybody's hustle, but at the same time, right. it's not the only, the end all be all to what a woman should be. Right. And so I wanted to create something for people with a voice like me. So I absolutely understand and respect what you guys are doing because I think women need to see that right women need to see that they're strong men in our communities and that they're taking care of their children they're working they're giving back to the communities they are fathers and brothers and uncles and and pastors and mm -hmm. and and construction workers right and whatever okay. the gambit and and mm -hmm. us also and as a mother also being able to show my son those examples of of people in our community because they need to see that too right and that's from a mother's point of view but that's also from an educator point of view that we need more content period across yeah. the board that celebrates african-american and people of color culture in a healthy light balance i think what you're saying correct me if i'm wrong because i feel the same way we need a balance in our depictions and the right. depictions of who we are as black people in America don't tend to be balanced. They tend to lean uh, to one, you know, towards a certain way. And that's not the reality for all of us. And really what we're saying is, yes, there's certain depictions that might be rooted in some level of truth, but there's also other depictions that need to be right. exposed and revealed, right? Yeah, and, and they need a uh, voice. Exactly. And in the dominant culture and white culture, they have that balance. You got, trust me, you got some ratchet white folks out there. Oh yeah, I but... know. I saw the Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> Those are white yeah. people, white people in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got some ratchet and you got some wild I white folks. I couldn't stop watching but... but I was like, what is going on? 
glued to the TV, right? <laughs> glued, just. But it was just nonsense. It was just pure nonsense. It was crazy. But you couldn't turn it off, right? No, I watched the whole thing in one night. <laughs> I'm sitting there like, ep- let the episode go back to back to back. I'm just sitting there like this. What? How do it shot yeah. up? No cops running up on us. I was like, what? My, my, my. What? It was something. What but, in the trailer park is going on? <laughs> you know? And, and the thing is, those those uh, uh, depictions can exist because in white communities, they have enough balance. They have a, right. enough other depictions to balance that right. those that that Tiger King depiction out. Right. And in the black community, we don't have enough of that. We are even still at this date. We're a little better, but not as not that much better. There's still uh, dominant stereotypes and depictions. Yeah. And uh, we need to make sure that there's more of a balance. And I think that's what you were saying. You wanted to represent more of that balance. And I know that's what the Three Kings talk is seeking to do. We want to represent those other depictions and we want to help contribute to the balance of the pictures right. that exist. Yeah, I like that. Practice. I definitely think there needs to be more balance balance and I think there needs to be more voice and I yes. think there needs to be more celebration in those people cuz they don't get celebrated enough. Like we're out here celebrating nonsense, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 baby mothers and 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 people getting out of jail and I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate those things, right? Having a baby is wonderful, getting out of jail is great. But Mm -hmm. there's people in our communities who are going to school, doing the donations, doing the drops, helping people out, cooking food, and we don't celebrate it enough. We just don't, we don't acknowledge it. We don't celebrate it, not just as our community, but any community, you know, it almost seems kind of like, you know, it it, it happens and there's no voice to it. And I think that those people need a voice and not only do they need a voice, but they need to see representation across the world. And podcasts like yours and hopefully podcasts like Three Kings Talk, what it does is it allows us to control the narrative. It allows us to tell our story and tell these stories without someone else trying to say, no, you need to do it this way. You need to do it that way. No, we want to be the the narrators of our own story. We want to tell our own story from the perspective that we have lived our lived experiences. So, yeah. What I can also appreciate about your show. And so, by the way, I did go listen to your first episode. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> of course I did. I left the review too. Um, so I did go listen to your uh, first episode. And what I was thinking when I was listening to it was also that, you know, a lot of times when people are talking or a lot of times when I started doing my research for my own podcast, it was like these little niche markets of people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think for us coming from the community where we live and the stuff that we are, the nice balance about it is like, yeah, I'm talking to you straight and yeah, I'm giving it to you the way life is, but it's also, you know, I went to school with you. I'm in your same demographic. I'm in your same socioeconomics. Um, you know, it's not someone above you saying, don't cry. You know, it's not a rich person mm-hmm. saying, don't cry. Cause you're poor, you know, and yeah. or, or the opposite, you know, I think it's mm-hmm. really important that no, I'm talking to you because I'm at the same place where you are. I'm at the same age. I'm at the same group. I, I've been through some of the things that you have been through. And while we can make fun of it and we can laugh at it, I'm also here to educate you and share with you. And I think that's important because a lot of times when people do want to enlighten someone else, it's almost like you're on a pedestal somewhere. I said this in my own show. I was like, it's either the Oprah's and the Gales that act like they never ate fried chicken from the Kennedy spot. <laughs> or it's the Cardi B's that act like you can't turn that shit off to walk into a certain room and know how to behave, right? And mm-hmm. so it's really important to find that median because the, the truth is, day to day, we that regular median person, you know? Yeah. And so really, I think that's the nice thing about listening to the show. It was like, yo, I, I, I can listen to them because we talk the same way and we know the same slang and whatever the case yeah. may be. But I also know that I'm taking something from this that could enlighten me and make me a better person. I appreciate you listening. Thank you so much. Yeah. You already know I listen to you. <laughs> I listened to one before we got on. I listened to the latest one. Oh, my. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which one was that? Smash or Pass? The last one was, uh, yes. Yeah. Because some ladies don't know which one they are. They be, they be fooling themselves. So that's why I did that episode. I was like, some women, there's women out here that are like, no, I'm a wifey chick. And all, everybody, everybody, even your mama know you not. <laughs> you don't have those qualities you know you gotta I, I, work I will, on that i was just a listener on that episode i will make no comments but i will let you know i, I did listen 
I'm just saying. <laughs> I did listen. Sometimes we show. have to be really reflective of who we are yeah. and ourselves yeah. and what we're putting out there because I that's agree. what you're going to get back. I agree. Right? I agree. And so, I agree. Get out there is what you get back. I agree. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, your big sis Karen got to be like, no, you need to rethink that. That's not yeah. how that works. You know and what I mean? Should have, and that show, which I'm grateful for, should come from big sis. Big brother don't need to have that. <laughs> no. that's, big brother chills out. And that's why I'm yeah. just saying I listened to the show. It was a great yeah. show. Yeah. That's, that's, no, that's I go it. a little hard on the ladies, but I think that as women, we can all, every day, everybody can work to be a, a better person. Yeah. And and you Indeed. can be whatever you want to be, but you have to also be honest and reflective with yourself. You know, Indeed. and sometimes you need somebody to tell you, like, mm, I don't, you know, maybe the That's mirror right. you're looking in is dirty. We got to clean that up a little bit, and you gotta understand who you are. And when you better understand who you are, then you understand why certain shit happened in your life the way it's happening. Understood. Understood. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> it, it's like hood therapy. That's what. That's what it is. Yeah. We <laughs> all need that. We all need that. Sometimes. It's like hood yes, therapy. Indeed. So yeah. what's next for Weldon, man? I am going to, uh, I'm glad you said that. Uh, so uh, I like to write. One of my hobbies is to write, read and write. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know that uh, probably later this year, uh, there is a book on what is called African demography. And basically what that is, is a concept of looking at how black folks have, have been studied or how studies about black folks have typically been uh it's a book coming out and i'm glad to say that i uh, had i've contributed a chapter towards that okay book. Well, then. yeah so uh I, I actually wrote a chapter on um black liberation theology which is the ministerial perspective that i come out of black liberation theology and the need to fight for a living wage as opposed to a minimum wage wow. so uh, i'm glad that that will come out later this year i guess if everything remains on schedule because i know yeah. everything is shut down it was scheduled to come out later this year and i'm i'm in the midst of working on uh, uh my second book right now um that will just kind of detail how i came into um the spiritual enlightenment that i have now uh, so I'm working on that. And then other than that, continuing to pastor, uh, at Christ Temple Baptist Church, I'm blessed to be the pastor there and to continue to teach and look for things, uh, you know, as far as in the teaching realm, I just want to continue just doing what I do and, yeah. um, I'm blessed. So I, I have no complaints, even though I know I do complain when I look back <laughs> do you, at it. You really don't have... seem like you complain. I do in my private time, but I shouldn't, you know, yeah. I, don't, I should not complain. I, I, I recognize my blessings. I recognize I am blessed, you know, and uh, when I, you know, sit back and have an opportunity to just like, talk to people like you and and just even hear some of the things that I'm, I'm a part of, you know, yeah. it, it, it causes me to reflect. So I am blessed and uh, I'm just going to hopefully I just continue to do some of the things that I've been doing. Yeah. Um, and, and hopefully that'll just breed new opportunities, new things. And, and they'll present it. themselves. Tell, yeah. tell me about the first book. So the first book I wrote was actually just the dissertation that I defended and I just put it in book form. I self-published it. Uh, it's called, um, the kingdom at hand. Uh, I really looked at a particular Christian denomination called the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church and its relationship to black liberation theology. So I know this wow. sounds all academic. Nah, 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 they just big words. Okay. I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what, what black liberation theology is, is it basically asks, um, what does it mean to be black and Christian? And it recognizes that in places like America, but more increasingly the world, but in places like America, race impacts everything you do. And this does not exclude religion. So right. what does it mean to be black and Christian in America, uh, especially when you know uh, mainstream Christianity and the way a lot of folks still think about and, and the way mainstream Christianity is still promoted when it seems to be uh, uh, anti-black, you know, what does it mean to be Christian and black? And, uh, you know, that's, and, and I looked at this particular 
Christian church that called itself the Shrine of the Black Madonnas. They were very adamant that Jesus is a black revolutionary, that Mary was a black woman, um, that Jesus was empowering a group of exploited, oppressed people like black folks in America yeah. have been doing, right? So um, my book just kind of looks at my research, my dissertation research, and that's what my book was. My, my book was that came out. Uh, I want to say 2016. Yeah, stuff. I kind of might want to look at that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I definitely. I, kinda, sure I definitely have, have some interest. You know, I feel like I don't. I don't particularly feel like I have a religion because I I like to learn about different religions and then take out the pieces that I like. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yep. I think that the more that you learn about different perspectives. Um, the more you kind of come narrow down and, da and drill down in, like I said, into who you are, right. And where you fit into all of this. And so that might be something I might be interested in looking at just, just, just to enlighten yeah. myself, because I just, yep. I think that, you know, I grew up in a Christian household. My mom goes to church every Sunday and, you know, you, 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 you know what, you know, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but then you get to a certain point in your life where you're like, okay, I know what I know, but I want to know more. Right, right. Right. And I want and to I'll, go outside of just that circle that you put me in or the box that you put me in and what I've been told and kind of go out and kind of grow it, you know, spiritually into whoever you are. And so for me, that means like going and reading a bunch of different books, because that's what I do. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to read about being Muslim. I'm going to read about, um, you know, Christianity. I'm going to read about spirituality. I'm going to read about Buddhist and then kind of saying, OK, well, I like this and I like that and I like this. And then I see how they're all similar or I see how they're all different, you know, mm -hmm. but I think the that that's like a really critical piece of information that you're sitting on there <laughs> that yeah. could well, definitely enlighten people. Well, when I was telling you about that interesting part of my life where God called me into the ministry, uh, there's certain things that, you know, when you when somebody says they've been called, it's like, well, how do you know? There's certain things that just hit you that you say that could have only been God. And uh, like I said before, I left organized religion from the age of 21 until I came back at 27. And um, it was just amazing because while I was out of organized religion, I lived in Philly. I was a real heavy community organizer activist. I mean, I got on marches. Uh, to combat police brutality in the black community. We challenged stop and frisk in Philadelphia. I was on marches so that, and you know, in Philadelphia now, you can't graduate high school without taking African-American history as a course. Like these were some of the things that I was a part of while I was in Philly, we were working for. And it was just, I felt initially that I could not be that concerned about the black community and Christian because my idea was that Christianity was this religion that came, right. you know, that, that, that was given to black folks during enslavement and I couldn't be a part of it. And I, I was a director, a principal of an African-centered school when I lived in uh, Philadelphia. And I never forget, I had one parent who was as pro-black as they come. Right. And she was Christian. And I remember asking her, how did she reconcile the two? Because at that time in my life, I didn't think you could. And at the time I made the choice to live very pro-black. Right. Uh, and she gave me a book to read and that's how the call and you know what god revealed to me is while you thought you were leaving me to be this activist and right. be so committed to community god was actually using it to shape and mold me to present jesus to me in a way that he knew i would receive it right and the way that god told me i need to also project it. so i see jesus as a an organizer who was trying to empower exploited people, oppressed people. That's what I work to try to do. People who was what I see Jesus as a revolutionary who was trying to overturn a corrupt empire who was, you know, oppressing and exploiting. That's what we do as community organizers and activists here. And, uh, you know, it's very clear and plain in the gospels, right? That, that Jesus had these values and I had to read them for myself rather than just listening to somebody right. preach about it. Right. Right. So. You internalize them on your own yeah. on your own terms and, and, and take it in on your own terms. I right. think you know what I mean? It's yep. different when someone's telling you, right? There's a difference when you're talking to someone and you're talking at someone. Right. You know, and so yeah. you gotta internalize that in your own way so that it speaks to your own way so that you take from it what you need. You know, and a lot yep. of people don't don't know that. They don't know how to do that. 
You know what I mean? It's kind of like I'm set in my ways. This is what I know. This is how I think. Not let me take this and and kind of and grow with it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so that's really important. Right. That's dope, though. Um, it's actually dope that you have a book. And <laughs> period. <laughs> I'm like, I want to do Thank that. You. I want to write a book. <laughs> Thank you. It's going to have you. about ten pages, but I want to write a book. Yeah. That's I, all. You just start. Just start. I I want to write. Somebody gave me a books. goal of. Okay. That's yeah. good. Somebody told me 250 words a day. Now I write more than that for the book, but you know, our English professor told me, depending on he write, I think he was trying to write novels and stuff. If you write yeah. 250 words a day, just be committed to that. That's and then light before work. you know it, yeah, before yeah, That's like you work. know, yeah, you That's know, if you in grad school, if you've been to grad, you know, two I've been to words. grad school and I don't know why yeah. I'm gonna do it again, but apparently, you know, I, <laughs> so I'm a you know 250 words is. Just yeah, like no. That. I was in grad school, stressing to the point where my eye was twitching. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't miss I, don't those I didn't drink that much wine yeah. ever in my life. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm gonna go yeah. back either to get my PhD or a second master. So now we're working on the second awesome. master's. Yeah, congratulations. Then, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah. I, I, again, I feel like I want to be in administration. I, I want to be able mm -hmm. to sit at the tables that have the discussions about the people in our communities. And I don't want to sit there just because I'm a black woman. I want to sit there because I'm a qualified black woman to be at that table. Well, we need that. That yeah. is my goal, right? Because it's one we, thing yeah. to be at the room and to be able to have a voice. It's another thing for people to listen to you because not only do you have the voice, but you have the experience and you have the credentials to be able to speak on a topic. And I think a lot of times in education, especially when it comes to minority students, there's people talking for them and speaking on their behalf that have no idea what it's like to live in those situations. Yeah. Or come from yeah. those neighborhoods. We need more people like you in those curriculum seats. Yeah. Who design curriculums. Yeah. And, and you know, like and, and we're making tests that ask kids questions that they have no, like, what's a, a wagon and a trailer and how many, like, the kids, I, I live in New York City, I ride the train, I don't know what this is. You know what right. I mean? So having right. culturally responsive, um, you know, curriculum and, and, and meeting the needs of those students in those environments and, and being able to sit there and say, well, now I know this because not only have I lived in this environment, um, but I'm also a mother and I'm also, you know, and being able, cause I don't think holistically the people that make those decisions are in those situations. Right. Yeah. True. Yeah. True. yeah. Well, I'm supporting and I can't wait till you get that second match. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see another year yeah, from you now. You got it. You well, got another it. year from now, and then we'll and then we'll move on to the next thing. Who knows? I, right. I'm much PhD. like you. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel like if I gotta go get a PhD, I gotta like go to Bora Bora every year. Like there's gotta. So what I did when I went back to school last time is every semester, whenever mm -hmm. I got really good grades, I gave myself like if I got all A's and I got B's, I would buy myself something or I would treat myself mm. something, right? Yeah. So I feel like go as this ladder climb, and then, then I bought myself some stupid things. I'm not gonna lie, because now I look back, I'm like, damn, I wasted my money on that. But now <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, if I gotta go back and get a second master's and a PhD, now the, the, the prize gotta get better. You, you know go. what I mean? Now I'm not yeah. buying pocketbooks. I'm buying plain. Yeah, I hear you. Ooh, ooh, I like that. <laughs> you know I what like I mean? That. I don't want to buy yeah. anymore. I throw my pocketbook on the floor like, damn, I spent $1,000 on this bag. Now I'm like, I could have, you know, I could have been in Thailand buying a tiger. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so, so that's the plan. Every time I do well, I treat myself to something well. And, and we'll see how that goes. Right. Well, thank that's you good. so much, Weldon, for taking the time to sit and kick it with me. Um, thank this you for having me. Tell everybody where they can find you, where they can find the podcast, um, where they can get the book. I mean, everything, everything. We want to know everything. Good, good. Uh, the podcast, Three Kings Talk. Please follow us. We have an Instagram page, Three Kings Talk. Uh, you can hear the podcast on iTunes, Google Play Music, Podbean, and we're hoping eventually we'll have more platforms where you can hear us at. Um, so follow the, the podcast there. You can follow my Instagram. It's Weldon McWilliams 4 uh if you want to uh you know follow me um the book you know uh book. outskirts press you could google the kingdom at, i mean you could find that barnes and nobles uh uh the kingdom at hand and weldon mcwilliams you'll you you should be able to find the book and hopefully get that 
Uh, I'll put it on my blog. It'll be also on my blog on my website. So I'll go find out the link up there on the blog. So if you go to safeblog.com, there's a blog page. You'll have a a little spot up there, and then I'll I'll put the link up there. Great, great. And I just thank you for having me as a guest, and I can't wait to bring you on our podcast because oh yeah, we definitely gonna need your energy. And and uh, you know, I think you would fit right in with us. I know you can hold your own. Three Kings don't intimidate you at all. <laughs> not, so, at all. Uh, not at all. <laughs> not at so all. So I'm looking forward to having you uh, on our podcast. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. I of really course. do. Of course. So guys, don't forget to check Weldon out on Instagram. Make sure you check out the podcast. Three Kings also have the link on my website. I'll have the book on my website. Um, and then if you have any questions and you can't find them, you can definitely reach out to me and I will direct you in the right way. Thank you, Weldon. Thank you. You. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Safe Loud. I appreciate all the love, the DMs, the messages, the text. Um, any way that you choose to engage with me, I appreciate it all. The shout outs, the repost, it means a lot. Um, especially on the days when I think nobody's listening and you guys are all listening and rooted for me. So I love you. Thank you so much. If you're looking for me, you can find me on social media. Um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, I am Karen L. And Say It Loud. Um, if you're looking for our website, www.sayith, S-A-Y-I-T-H, loud, L-O-U-D, sayithloud.com for all things Karen L., all things Say It Loud. If you'd like to do a donation, go ahead to the website and click donation. We're definitely taking donations. I need some new equipment. Um, we're growing. Um, and if you want to join our Patreon, you can go to the website, click the Patreon link, and uh, subscribe. YouTube is coming. Yes, there will be a visual added and a couple other projects going on. So definitely look out for that. And if you'd like to book Karen L for whatever or have her come on to your show, please go to the website, reach out to me. There's a Say It To Me tab. You can go ahead, shoot me an email, and we can discuss it. I would love to come out and uh, bring the energy and bring the vibes to you. Yeah, so thank you all. I'll see you next week. <laughs>